Wait, you didn't give me a list of questions? I can't do this! Oh gosh, we're done! <laughs> I like travel stuff, so I was like, I'll do that, and I'll also teach some stuff on, like... Remember that you like travel music. Thank you, Siri. Thank you. <laughs> you don't realize this, but today I'm gonna be your stunt double. <sighs> Yo! What's up, Indie Mogul? My name is Ted, and welcome back. And today we're talking about cinematic B-roll. Now, specifically B-roll for lifestyle content, the kind of stuff that you see in a lot of modern commercials and vlogs. These days, it feels like a lot of B-roll is being shot almost like documentary footage. It's run and gun, it's not pre-planned, and you've all of a sudden got all these shoots for cinematic B-roll that have this kind of spray and pray mentality. In a lot of ways, this makes sense. People are more obsessed these days with everything looking real, all content looking real. And for a lot of companies, it just doesn't make sense to kind of spend this huge budget on this super carefully pre-planned shot with lockdown locations when they could just send a small team to go out with their product and see what they can get. I know this because I make this decision basically every time Aperture releases a product. And surprise, surprise, for the good looking B-roll of people using our products, we almost always opt for just sending out a small team with one camera, one light to see what nice looking footage they can get at a nice looking location. So, what is the key to getting cinematic B-roll? How do you make sure your footage looks good when you can't even plan what's going to happen? And when it comes down to the wire, how do you make sure that no matter where you go, you'll always get usable footage? Talking about the stuff that the editor chopping the commercial is like, oh yeah, that's the stuff. So figure it out today. To find out more, we headed all the way out to the big CA to go visit my friend, Maddie Hapoya. But first, Hey, what's going on guys? 4 a.m. again. Going to the airport. This time we're going to Toronto. So we took an early flight out of Boston. We said goodbye to our friends Matt Workman and Diana Levine for a quick one day trip to Toronto. All right, Ted. Yes. Alrighty guys, so we just got to Toronto. We're gonna go through immigration. Have you come to Canada before? Yeah. We're gonna go pick up a car. This is your reach right here, one day. What the f I did not expect this. I went on and got the cheapest car in Expedia, and this is what we got. Broccoli soup. And then cream of broccoli soup. Yo, so it is uh, 9.30 right now. We're in Toronto. I think Maddie's studio is somewhere around here. Yo. What's up, dude? I th think we're outside. What's up, dude? Oh, yeah. How's it going, man? How are you, dude? It's been a little while. It's been a really long time. NAB, too. maybe? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's been like six, seven months. Now, if you don't know who Maddie is, he's basically one of the kings of travel and lifestyle B-roll. Not only does he have an entire channel dedicated to it, which literally was called Travel Feels, he's also one of my favorite filmmakers because of how fast he gets it done. And if you're familiar with Pete McKinnon, he's also the partner best buddy that helps make his vlogs look so good. All right, I think it's time to get some uh, epic B-roll. This, this one is you? my space, yeah, here's the C300, and the random yep. stuff. <laughs> now, this is just a small portion of our interview with Maddie. Be sure to check out the full length discussion in the podcast link down below. I like travel stuff, so I was like, I'll do that, and like, I'll also teach some stuff on like. I remember that you like travel music. Thank you, Siri. Thank you. <laughs> For you, I guess, what are the keys to getting cinematic B-roll when you're traveling? I don't script out or plan every single shot, but I know what my video is about, and I know, I know what I need to include in it for me to tell that story and for it to be a, a decent video. Tip one, plan story, not shots. So yes, you may not know the location or what's going to happen on your shoot, but the first key is to plan out what do you need to get. We're traveling from this place um, to the mountains or something like that. How can I bridge that gap? Okay, well, maybe I'll get some shots at the window. Maybe a, a drone shot would be great to show the landscape. I'll get a shot of Peter, whoever I'm with. In a nutshell, what Maddie is saying is to start with the why before you shoot the how. I guess that's a good way to think of it. I, I think of everything in sequences. So like, don't just get two shots of yourself or whoever, or just the landscape, whatever, you know. Think what kind of shots you need around that. And, How does uh, it work in the editing? Yeah, exactly. I'm always <laughs> editing in my head. Tip two, shoot in sequences. Now, I love this tip. And 
Though I don't really know where the term spray and pray came from, it's spray and pray. I feel like I can almost guarantee that it came from a frustrated editor trying to deal with footage from a bunch of cinematographers that didn't know how to follow this tip. If I have no idea what, what the heck to do, but this landscape is great or something like that, like I have like a, you know, Peter walking down from behind and yeah. then I'll get the feet. That's like kind of like my like signature shot. And then I'll get one from the side. So I, if, if I need to, I have that. And then I'll go like kind of like leading shot. So then you know who it is. Think about sequences. Shoot footage that you know will already cut with footage that you've shot. For sunset, I always want to be somewhere that's like just ridiculous. Tip three. Plan your day around your lighting. Now, traditionally, what we're talking about here is sunrise, sunset, i.e. golden hour when the sun looks really good. And that's because the sun is coming at an angle where it's going through more atmosphere, it's more diffused, and it's coming in at an angle that is much more attractive because instead of blasting in straight from above. Do you use any kind of stabilization systems a lot? So I used a glide cam for a long time. It's, it's hard because glide cam has a bigger, like a bigger learning curve, I think. Yeah. It's harder to pick up and use right away. But once you get it, it's like, it's so easy. Mm -hmm. Like it just works. But then, uh, so I've tried a lot of different gimbals, pretty much all the gimbal companies. And now I've been using the, the DJI Ronin S actually. Mm -hmm. I actually like that. Tip four. Stabilize your footage. Now, if you're sitting at home and you're like, but Ted, I got like two bucks and both of those go-go gadgets are way too expensive for me, chill. Let's say you don't have a gimbal or a stabilizer. You shoot in 120, it's gonna be pretty stable. So that's like a kind of a strategic thing also. I can, I can just whip out a 1DX, shoot in 120 and get a whole bunch of shots, just like running around, get like a ton of different shots really quickly without having to, hey guys, I'm just, hold on guys, I'm gonna set up my gimbal here and like balancing the gimbal and it's like, just wait guys, don't don't go over there, yeah, just, just wait, yeah, don't, don't. I know the sun's setting, but yeah, yeah. I'll get this done in a and minute. And then it's like, oh, gimbal's not working, oh, I gotta rebalance this thing, and like, you know. The point is, is that you gotta think about trying to stabilize your footage as much as possible. And you don't always need the fancy tools to do that. You can always go handheld, you can always try to smooth out your steps, kind of toe heel motions. I could shoot better stuff by I prioritize storytelling and what's happening. And YouTube's great for that. Like people love the yeah. raw quality. You don't always need it to look insane. Yes, we have finally come full circle. When you're on set and you see the chance to capture some really good looking, beautiful footage, it is super easy to forget the reason why you're there in the first place. What Maddie is saying here is basically a reminder. The shot that's going to make the edit is the one that tells the story the best, not the one that looks the most beautiful. After we did our interview with Maddie, we actually had the chance to implement some of these tips for a real commercial shoot that we need to do for a real after product. It's basically this tiny little light that's designed not only to be super bright, but also really rugged. Now that was our story. We wanted to show the light as something for travelers, something that worked not only great on set, but also something that was ready for adventure. I'll say that again, ready for adventure, which meant everything, our actors, our location, all of our shooting would revolve around that. But first, we had to wake up again. At 4 a.m. Again. Hey, Sean, what is that? This is the gates of the underwater housing. It's cold. Can't wait for the sunrise, you know? <laughs> So we took the first ferry out, timing it exactly so that when we were on the boat, we would catch the sunrise. And once we had our soft directional light, we started filming, all the while remembering to shoot in sequences. So wide, tight, front, and profile. The idea was to shoot the same scene multiple ways so that the footage could be seamlessly cut together in the edit. And we shot it all using the glide cam to make it as smooth and cinematic as possible. Now, we didn't shot list any of this before getting out there, but we also didn't really have to because we made a point of remembering our story the entire time. Ready for adventure. This became a guide for what kind of footage we needed to get. The question quickly became, what shots would show that this little light was ready for adventure? Now, when we finished filming, we took a moment to stop and plan our day around our lighting once more. We're using a tool here called Sunseeker. If you don't know it, it's an app for your phone. It's amazing. The idea is that basically you can point your camera into the sky and the app will actually tell you where the sun will be and at what time. So we're gonna arc this way. So it looks like we'll have clear sun all day unobstructed in the mountains. Yeah. Which is actually when we realized a huge problem. And then our sunset's gonna be on that side of the island. The sun would never set. I, I mean, it would, of course, just not visibly or anywhere near our shoot. 
And in between the sunset and our shooting location was a giant mountain, which was a huge problem, both figuratively and literally. So we asked some locals what we could do and literally none of them could tell us where we would be able to see a sunset. Thank you so much. Okay. We're on the side of the island where we're not gonna see a sunset, so we gotta find some yeah. way to... Looks like we're hiking. That is, until our waiter overheard us over breakfast. All right, we just wanna see like the, the sunset, we're gonna see some trees and yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can go there in the top. It turns out that if we rented a golf cart and really sprinted up one side of the mountain, maybe, just maybe, we might have a chance at catching that sunset. But that was something that we would need to do later because we still had a lot to shoot. So while noonday is terrible for shooting exteriors, it actually is great for one thing, and that is shooting underwater. Which is why... Oh man, we're about to go diving, dude. Now for our underwater setup, we opted for two cameras. One, a red 8K Helium in Gates underwater housing, and two, a Canon 1DX in Aquatech underwater housing. Both are super fancy expensive cameras because we're shooting a real commercial. What do you expect? The idea here is that I'm gonna shoot Sean shooting Lana. And this is what we have to do on after shoots. We have to pay for two cameras every time. We gotta pay for two crews every time. So we need a crew to shoot the crew. And in this case, because of Indie Mogul, we need a crew to shoot a crew to shoot a crew. Ridiculous. <laughs> and because we're going super skeleton crew on this, I not only shot footage of Sean and Lana, but I also put on a woman's wetsuit. Hot. Oh, hey. dude. Hot Don't stuff, dude. This, dude. My wetsuit is gonna be the same color as Lana's wetsuit. Today I'm gonna be your stunt double. Uh, <laughs> yep, the same women's wetsuit as Lana, so that Sean and Lana could shoot footage of me, but actually have the audience think that I'm Lana. <laughs> I gotta be totally honest too, one of these underwater housing things comes from Kitsplit. You know who you are out there. This camera breaks. Come for you. Now, when we were underwater, it was beautiful. It was literally an entirely different world. But the same principle still applied. First, we focused on story. Which shots would show that our light was ready for adventure? We made sure to get multiple shots of multiple people using the light. First, a shot of Sean, and then a shot of me. I know, I probably could have shaved for the part. Now, whenever we could, we made a point to capture shots of Sean and Lana traveling together since it continued our story of two people ready for adventure. Then we went ahead and remembered to shoot in sequences. So multiple angles of the same action, front, back, and side. And then different framings, so wide, close up over the shoulder. And then since I couldn't body double for Lana the entire time, I passed off the camera to her so that she could film us while we filmed her with the camera. My footage will look like a born identity. <laughs> you mean the ones that are like, like this? <laughs> and honestly, her footage is totally usable. Now the main thing here is that we planned out our day around our lighting so that it already looked good, so that no matter where you pointed your camera, it would look pretty decent. You really need that light penetrating and that you get these really refractive beams and there's some cool shots where it's like a person swimming by, blown out sky here, the beams of light coming through. Now, since it was noon daylight, we got these crystal clear rays of light that can really only be seen when your light source is hard. As for stabilization, being underwater was already kind of smooth enough to dampen the shot a good bit. We also made a point to shoot in 60 frames per second to smooth out that motion as much as possible. And for those really complicated shots, we actually had our dive master come help hold us steady so that we can maintain buoyancy while getting that shot. Now, by the time that we finished all of our underwater shooting, the sun was already beginning to disappear. And to be totally honest, it didn't really look like we were going to catch our sunset until our dive master actually overheard us and he offered to let us borrow his golf cart. Mark, do you think we have a chance of catching sunset? You gotta do it quick. We gotta go quick, right? Yeah. So we piled into the golf cart, we floored the gas pedal, which meant probably going like 25 miles an hour. And then we sped off as quick as we could up the mountain chasing daylight until we hit a dead end. Now, I'm not from Catalina, so maybe someone out there can tell us if there actually is a direct way up the mountain, but we couldn't find it. So we settled for the next best thing and shot during blue hour, which is actually the hour after the sun sets, but the sky isn't totally dark yet. So we found a cliff that we could shoot at as if we were at the top of the mountain and then filmed a little sequence to finish our day. And finally, for Maddie's last tip, while there was tons of beautiful nature all day and literally all around us, we made sure to focus on one thing, the story of our commercial and that we were ready for adventure. 
I'm just trying to make fun content that I enjoy and that people can learn or just be entertained by. Because I think if I'm enjoying it, other people are gonna enjoy it also. If I'm hating it, that's gonna show. And there you have it. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked this episode, make sure you hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. Now you can catch the full length discussion with Maddie where we go deeper into cinematic travel filmmaking, as well as how Maddie got a start in the podcast link down below. So the only like mm -hmm. actual training I have right now is a bachelor's in theology. So I, I'm a YouTuber. <laughs> Make sure you tune in next week when I go to go visit Caleb Pike from DSLR Video Shooter and we find out what are the top nine things that every filmmaker needs in their kit. That is it for me. I'm Ted from Indie Mogul and I will see you guys in the next one. Purpose of your trip? Uh, just personal. Really not fun. How do you know them? Uh, I know them through the internet. <laughs> anyway, cool.